Welcome to the Hunt Back Country podcast. This is episode number 497, and today we are sharing a story from one of you guys, a listener of the show. Jared and Cody join us to tell us about their caribou hunt in Alaska from this fall. As you will hear, they planned a drop camp caribou hunt, and with four of them in their group total, were able to fill all four tags. But it wasn't without setbacks, delays, and lessons learned. And you'll hear about all that, the good and the bad, in this conversation. If you have a listener story to share with us, it doesn't have to be Alaska, it doesn't even have to be this big, grand adventure. But if you have a hunt story from this fall with lessons learned, unique experiences, or maybe a special opportunity, let us know if you are interested in being considered to join the show and add a listener story in the future. You can send that and any other questions you may have for the show to podcast at exomountaingear.com. And if you are enjoying the show, please take a minute to consider leaving a rating or review in whatever podcast app you use. It does help us out. And because we don't have any advertisers or sponsors or don't market this show heavily with things like online ads, your support of the show and sharing it with those ratings or reviews or telling a friend does help us out and help this show continue to grow. Thanks for doing that. Right now, let's get into this conversation with Jared and Cody. When I have two guys who need to share an introduction background, instead of having them introduce themselves, I have them introduce each other. So Jared, tell me about Cody. How did you guys meet? Anything about him? Things like that. So I met Cody probably about six years ago and like we said earlier it was through our kids um cody has two boys and i have three and two of them were you know about the same age going to the same school and they were doing the same sports and everything and our wives were mutual friends and so we kind of got introduced that way um and both like-minded people we both hunt so we, we found a common interest and you know how it is going to after school activities. You kind of move to people that are yeah. like you. So I, I found out Cody was a big hunter and I was too. And we just kind of hit it off then, become friends. Anything to add, Cody, about Jared? No, I mean, pretty much what he said. Um, you know, you kind of gravitate to people that, that you can have some kind of. Uh, you know, something to tie you together. And um, last year I had a, an elk hunt up in Wyoming on a family ranch and invited Jared. And that's when we kind of got closer was on that hunt and, you know, started looking at what else we wanted to do. And Alaska has always been high up on my list. I know Jared had been to Alaska a few times, so that's kind of what got the wheels turning on the next adventure. And, um, you know, we had originally planned on doing this caribou hunt in 26 with two different buddies and um you know coming back from albuquerque one day got a phone call from jared saying you know outfitter that we were wanting to use had a cancellation in 24 and wanted to know if i could make that work um hung up with him talked to the wife for about five minutes and told him i was good to go at what point was that how was like how close was this to getting that call and when is the hunt? So when I got back from Alaska last year, I was helping a buddy on a doll sheep hunt. And while we were hunting, we seen some caribou. And I, and I was like, man, this is, this is pretty neat. Like, I think we could do this as non-residents. Uh, it's a fairly affordable hunt compared to, you know, the guided stuff. And I was trying to get a list of buddies together that I thought would would work out to do something like this. As soon as I got back, I started doing some research on how we could do a hunt like this. And that's when I reached out to Cody and our couple other buddies. And we were planning, like you said, 2026. And then I was scrolling on, I think it was Instagram. And uh, this was in February. And I seen where the transporter posted a cancellation for September. So I'd called Cody and I was like man because we were already amped up as soon as I got back and we started talking about it you know how when you start planning a trip you can't sleep at night you're 
you're steadily researching, watching YouTube, reading the forms, everything else, getting all amped up about it. And so I knew Cody was the same way I was when I, when I called him and told him like, Hey, we can go in September. If you're up to it, he was all on board. But then our two other buddies kind of backed out. They, they had other obligations they had to do this year. So we were like, well, we can do it just two people. It's not a big deal, but my father-in-law lives in Montana and he's been, every time I go to Alaska, he tells me, he's like, man, I'd really like to go on a hunt with you up there before I get too old and I can't make it up the mountains. I, so I talked to Cody and I was like, man, this would be a great opportunity for, you know, to bring my father-in-law along if you're okay with it. He was, oh yeah, it's, it's great. And then I was like, well, three people would be cool, but four would probably be better if we do split up that way we could do two and two and it'd be a lot easier getting animals out of the field and whatnot. So we got another mutual friend from Montana to come with us. So then it, we were back to four again. It was kind of a strange dynamic because I had never met his father-in-law or other friend prior to, I mean, meeting up in Anchorage. Um, you know, we were on a group chat together for, oh, I'd say the better part of six months. So I felt like I knew him, but I had never really, you know, met him. And um, I mean, it, it was like we were old friends. I mean, just went on the trip, no hiccups. I mean, everybody did their part and it was, I mean, went well. Yeah, the dynamic of everybody was perfect. And I knew it would be. Uh, my father-in-law, he's a great guy and he's just like me and Cody, you know, you can BS with him and he doesn't take stuff too serious. And Curtis, his buddy, I've known him for about, oh man, 15 years. Every time I go to Montana to see my father-in-law, I also see Curtis. So we'll have dinner or something up there. And he's just a great guy. Nice. So I knew I knew Cody would get along with all these pro people. We wouldn't have a problem. Right. Cool. Jared, it's come up. You've been in Alaska. I know you mentioned the one thing you helped your buddy on at all sheep. Just real quick. Any other experiences in Alaska? Just like what have you done up there? So my first trip to Alaska was a over-the-counter bear hunt. And it was more, I've got a, a, a buddy that lives up there that has a cabin and a business and a moose camp and he was like oh we could we the most e the easiest hunt i could do for you is we could just go to moose camp and see the osva's getting a bear pretty pretty low but i'll get to show you alaska you know so we went in on argos for like 30 something miles through swamps and river crossings and everything and finally made it to his moose camp and we hunted up there for about a week and he ended up getting a bear but I did not. So when we came home from that hunt, I was really hooked. Um, I know you've probably done the same thing since your first trip to Alaska. Once you go, it feels like you need to go every year. Something about it, I, I would, I don't know, I would turn down tax here just to be able to go to Alaska for the opportunity just to be up there again, even if I wasn't holding a tag like last year. I knew I wasn't going to have that tag and I probably will never spend the money to get a doll sheep tag, but I wanted to experience the hunt. So the best thing is just going with somebody that does have the tag. And it was a great experience. I can definitely relate. I'm planning on going on a sheep hunt next year and don't have a tag. Just like, Hey, yeah. let me come. I'll be a free packer. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's exactly what I told him too. I was like, man, I'll be another set of eyes and I'll help you pack it out. Yeah. Cause nobody really wants to do a sheep hunt by themselves. Right. Yeah. So it worked out great. Nice. Well, you guys find out about this cancellation. This is, do you mind sharing? I mean, I I think it's okay to share. Like, is was this up out of Kotzebue? Were you guys? Yes, it, this was out of Kotzebue. Okay, gotcha. So I just wanted to set the broader context because I know one thing we want to talk about is, I mean, it's pretty common for caribou hunts to be more drop camp style. We've obviously talked about our caribou hunt this year, which was different because it was, you know, we still flew in, used a transporter, but it was more, a bit more DIY and like mobile, obviously, because we were pack crafting and whatnot. But this is more, you guys get dropped, you get picked up later. Um, it's more like the caribou hunt I've done previously in 2019, which is just a different dynamic. Um, both very cool Kotzebue's of, a unique places i'm sure you guys can attest yeah. to 
Um, yeah, but yeah, in the six months of seeing this cancellation, essentially booking this, I mean, six months is a pretty short time to go from not on the radar to going and doing a drop camp caribou hunt in Alaska. And obviously it's helped Jared, like you've had some experience in Alaska, but I'm just curious in those six months, what were the common questions or things you guys were figuring out amongst this group of four guys who were going up there? Like what were the big question marks and things to, to solve? First off, you know, finding and buying tags. Um, we already had our outfitter, you know, transport service figured out. But um, gear was the hot thing for the first probably two, three months. I mean, just everybody doing their own research, sharing stuff with the group. I mean, Jared pretty much spearheaded everything. He, We kind of leaned on his experience and, hey, what do you think about this? Jared, what, what would you say? I was more telling the guys like, hey, y'all, two of the guys that are in Montana, they elk hunt, mule deer hunt, everything else. Cody does the same thing. Y'all have the gear you need. You probably don't need to spend a bunch of money on extra gear. You're going to end up taking way too much stuff that you're not going to need. So before you purchase anything, get with me and I'll tell you if you actually need it or not. Yeah. Because you know how it is. when you And Cody and Barton Curtis, this was their first hunt like this especially you know out of state in alaska and everything else so there's a lot of unknowns mm -hmm. so they were you know thinking well hey we need this we need this like no you, you really don't you have everything you need as long as you have rain gear and puffy gear and basically your sleep system that's all you need you don't mm -hmm. need a bunch of fancy stuff to go on these hunts did you guys like the few things that come to mind for me just trying to think through when we did that hunt up in the brooks i think it one you're right it if you've already been hunting elk hunting western deer hunting etc you probably have a lot of what you need it's just for me it was like certain things of some guys may not have a shelter that's suitable um just based on things like the winds you can get up there right may not have decent enough rain gear and then outside of that i don't know if you guys did anything for waders hip waders hip boots anything like that so on those couple things specifically shelter um rain gear and then any sort of like waiter-esque type items yeah what so, did you guys do there so we opted for on the transport service you can add on to rent camp from the transporter okay, so instead yeah. of taking shelter systems with us we just decided to go with their their camp setup which is you know alaska god series six person tent which you start watching youtube videos that's pretty much what everybody has up there it gives you a little bit more room than taking say a three-man shelter for two people and being crammed in there for a week um, and plus we didn't want to carry all that stuff on the plane up there it was just easier that way and we knew the wind was going to be pretty tough. So I didn't want to take like a, one of these three season shelters that we use here in New Mexico. I didn't think they would hold up to the wind. Um, and as far as rain gear, I did tell everybody buy the best that you can buy. Uh, you will be living in it the whole time. That's every hunt I've ever done in Alaska. I don't even hardly take pants anymore. I just long johns and rain pants. That's it. That's basically what you need. So everybody did have good rain gear. And we also decided to take, we, we talked about, because you don't know where you're going to get dropped off. They they don't really tell you until the day of. After doing a bunch of research, I kind of figured out where we were going to be, the unit, and what the terrain kind of looks like. And I figured we might have some river and creek crossings. So I, I wanted to have some kind of waiter. And I think we all ended up getting the wiggies just over the boot. Uh, the canvas material that mm -hmm. you just slide over. They're super light. I think they weigh about a pound. You can throw them over your boots, get across the creek, throw them on your pack, let them dry out and move on. And that we only, me and Cody used them twice and they were nice to have. Uh, I would recommend them because it's one of those deals. It's a hundred bucks. You don't know if you're going to need them, but man, they're sure nice when you do need them. Something I would add to that, it was kind of a realization when I got there. If you're used to having pockets on your pants, 
and you use them, make sure your rain gear has pockets. Mine did not. And it was kind of an inconvenience. It's not a big deal. It just, man, I'm constantly searching for the stuff I keep in my pockets and didn't <laughs> yeah. have pockets to speak of. Um, what type of things are you, like, would you normally be keeping in your pockets? Like, I know that's a super nitty gritty question, but what, what was it specifically? Um, I mean, typically, you know, just knife. Um, you know, a lot of times I'll take my gloves off and wad them into my pocket. Um, I kind of just moved everything up into my vino pouch. And, you know, once I kind of muscle memory re remembered it was in my vino pouch instead of my pocket, I quit reaching for it. Um, and it wasn't a big deal. Just, man, those rain pants would have had pockets. It would have made them better for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pockets are good. Is, I, I keep my phone in my hip pocket at all times. But other than that, there's not, not a whole lot in my pockets. Um, but I would recommend zip off pants or at least halfway zip down so you can for the rain gear release. yeah yeah for the rain gear just to be able to release heat and like i said i, I would recommend to anybody just long johns and rain pants you can get by with pretty much anything there when you get hot unzip them you can still hike when you get cold zip them up and you're you'll be fine i know we skipped over this um I don't know we've talked about it in email, but I don't even <laughs> I don't even remember. You guys date wise were somewhere in the first half of September, right? Yes, we were we were scheduled to fly out to the field on the third. Got it. So essentially, roughly the yeah first wrapping under the second week, and yep. then you mentioned using the transporter for shelter, which I'm I'm glad you brought that point up. I don't know that we've ever talked about that as an option because we haven't done that on our hunts, but it is a pretty common option, especially for these drop camp hunts. And I also know that some of those include shelter and or all food as well. So did you guys yes. do anything there or did you bring all your own food? So I had talked to the transporter prior to us getting there and, and I asked him if we could split the camp and just get the camp and the cots and not do the stove and the food because that's what the camp officially comes with is your tent cots table chairs uh, all your food utensils some pots and pans and Cody, that's about it huh yeah um, that's so it's a full-on like drop camp you basically yeah, just a, show up with your clothes your weapon sleep system. What you need to hunt. Yeah, yep sleep yep system. that's it and so i, ch I tried talking them into maybe cutting down the cost and just giving us the, the tent and the cots and we would bring all our food because I knew it was going to be Mountain House. And I'm not a big fan of Mountain House. Um, but he ended up saying, oh, it's too complicated. So I was like, okay, that's fine. So we did end up bringing extra food um, that we knew we liked, you know, like the peak refuels and everything else. But ended up not needing it. He gave us way too many mountain house i think we had between me and cody for you know a six-day hunt we had over 30 dehydrated meals that they provided us holy smokes yeah and we were eating one a day you know just for dinner we would just we brought snacks you know beef jerky and nuts and bars and stuff like that we would eat throughout the day but they give you plenty of food so if you do go that route don't bring any extra food <laughs> you'll yeah. be fine and was it was what they provided pretty much mountain house for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It was. Yeah. And they, yeah. they did give you some potatoes and onions and uh, a jar of peanut butter and jelly and some tortillas and then a bunch of candy and coffee and little stuff like that. I mean, you could definitely get by with what they gave you. We, gotcha. we ended up giving it all right back to them. Yeah. Cool. Well, let's dive into the hunt the experience start breaking down the trip a little bit because obviously we just covered planning let's get into this thing um feel free to touch on anything flight wise commercially you know you fly commercial escal airlines to kotzebue then you have a little bit of time in kotzebue and then hopefully get out into the field weather dependent um usually the next day if you can so if there's anything to talk about there go ahead if not if you guys want to skip to like hey we got into the field and started hunting we can go straight there as well 
No, we'll start from the beginning because I think it's crucial for people to understand how this works. It's once you fly commercial into you, you have you have to go to Anchorage, and then most of the time you have to wait till the next day to get into Kotzebue because there's I think two flights. One of them's at seven thirty, and one of them's at like ten thirty. Um, so once you get into Kotzebue, I'd talk to the transporter and, and ask him, "Hey, we're coming a day early." is there any chance we might be able to get out, you know, weather depending and if your schedule allows it, he's like, yeah, you know, there's always a chance just depends on weather. We're like, okay, so we're amped up. We get to Kotzebue. And as soon as we get off the plane, we start going towards the hotel. And I'm like, man, I thought we were going to the airstrip, you know, aren't we maybe going out today? And they're like, Oh, absolutely not. Like, okay, no big deal. We, we kind of, we kind of thought that and we had bought a hotel room they're in Kotzebue just in case. So we get to the hotel room and get everything set up and pulled out, walk around town, go to dinner. And they told us, you know, Hey, at eight 30, uh, check your phone. We'll let you know if we're going to go out. So eight 30 go rolls around and you're like, Nope, weather's bad. We'll holler at you at nine 30. So nine 30 comes around. Nope. Weather's still bad. And this goes on until about 12, and kind of no no messages are coming in. And we have to check out of our hotel at 11. So we're sitting in the lobby playing cards. And finally, I don't, I don't want to bug these guys. That was one thing doing the research on this hunt. It seems like the bad reviews that you do read online are about communication. But I think a lot of that is people don't know what to expect on a hunt like this and they're used to just go, go, go. And when you, when you're going on a transporter service like this, it's all about the weather and you don't know what the weather's doing where you're going. We ended up flying in like 120 miles from town and we don't know what the weather's doing over there. So it's tough when you're just sitting and you're amped up, ready to go. Um, but it is what it is. Cody, you got anything to touch on that? I always, you know, knew that there was a good possibility that we wouldn't fly the days we thought we would. I assumed that we would get to the field. It never really came across my mind. We would be stuck in town before we went out. I thought we might get stuck in the field. Um, it, even knowing that we were going to have delays, it was still very frustrating. I mean, you can only sit around the hotel room so long before it's like, man, why aren't we out there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we all had to just realize that you go when they say go, and it doesn't really matter why you're not flying. <laughs> it's just, yeah. I mean, it, it's a hundred percent in their control and you have to mentally be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've mentioned this with our trips and it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to live it. And then Absolutely. but once you do it, it's just like you realize it's so it's a different pace up there and it can be frustrating or feel like, why are we not out there? You know, you're you have a limited time off work. You have limited time away from family. You paid good money for this. And then you feel like you're wasting all of that as you're sitting there. But that's not what they want either. Like they're all I say all <laughs> they're mostly doing their best. Um, right. And they, I mean, they want to be flying too, because when they're backed up and things aren't on schedule, that messes everything. It makes everything harder on everyone, on, on you, on their next client, on their last client, on the people stuck in the field and the people coming into the town the next day. Like, but yeah, it's just, it's pretty much outside of everyone's control. Yeah, that's exactly right. In our experience, it wasn't, Hey guys, sorry, the weather's bad. Or, I mean, there was no explanation. It was just not happening today. Yeah. And and I think that's the frustrating part. It's like, man, everything we're seeing is clear skies. Like, what's mm -hmm. up? But like I said, it, it really doesn't matter what the reasoning is. It's either we're flying or we're not. So, yeah. So on that, I would say have a group leader that's in communication with the transporter that is most even tempered person of the group. <laughs> that's a great tip. Yeah. Yeah. Because 
Yeah, I'm glad if, it wasn't Bart. <laughs> if Bart or Cody would have been texting the transporter, it would have been rough. Uh, so yeah. is this we ended up sitting in town for four days before we were oh, able to fly man. out. It's so it was tough. A night. Yeah, four hundred bucks a night, and you're paying anywhere from it's really about seventy to seventy to a hundred dollars a plate of food in that town per person. So it's pretty costly when you're just sitting around twiddling your thumbs playing Uno. Yeah. But I told the guys, I was like, look, man, it's out of our control. All we can do is sit and wait. When they say it's go time, it'll be go time, and you will forget about these last four days. It, yeah. It'll be erased from your mind. Yeah, all that math goes away real quick when they say load up. <laughs> is that how it went down? Did it like go from wait, wait, wait to like a pretty quick let's roll? It did, yeah. I think it was day four or five. I think we get the call to, hey, get your stuff. Come down to the lobby. We're going out. So we get loaded up, go to the landing strip, and we're all excited getting everything rearranged out of your big bags into smaller totes and stuff and getting your rifle ready to go. And um, we see a plane take off. And it's like, oh, man, I thought we were supposed to be on that one. And then another plane comes in and they're like, Hey, two people load your stuff up. Let's go. I mean, it was fast. Uh, so we kind of flipped quarters to see who gets to go out first. Me and Cody, we were able to jump on the first plane and we take off. It's a, about an hour, hour and 15 uh, flight out to the field. And we get dropped off and I talked to the pilot and I was like, Hey, is that other pilot getting the other two? And he's like, I don't know. I lost communication with them. He's like, if not, I'll, I'll go get them and bring them. Because I was kind of worried that they weren't going to make it out the same day as us. So Cody and I, we started setting up camp and getting everything organized. And once we did that, we grabbed our water jugs and hiked down to the river, filled camp water. And as we were hiking back up the mountain to get back to camp, we, we hear the next plane coming in. So it was about three hours later, the other two guys get there and, get camp set up and while me and Cody were getting water, we had already started glassing up caribou. And so we were all pumped up, excited, thinking, man, this is going to be great. Uh, but we have to wait a day because of Alaska's rules on flying. But they had dropped us off with another camp already in the field. And we were kind of disappointed in that because we kind of like wanted close? our own experience. Like a hundred yards. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah. But he like told us our neighbors. Yeah, I was a father and two sons um, from Florida, and they were supposed to be coming out the next day. So our first hunt day would essentially be their day out of the field. Okay. Yeah, so it wasn't a big deal. It, it was kind of disappointing, but it was fine. And, and we got some field knowledge from those I was going to say, guys. you get some so intel. Was, and Yeah, yeah. It, it was it was good. So they were gone when we showed up. They were out hunting. By the time we got all camp set up that evening, we seen them coming over the ridge with the bull. So it was pretty exciting. You know, we already, we seen that they had one bull in camp and now they're packing out a second. So we all go over there and start BSing with them and, you know, getting some information and find out that, man, the, the weather conditions have been horrible. The wind's been blowing 70 miles an hour. The bears have been stealing all their meat. Uh, they they made it sound like this was a tough, miserable hunt. Um, they still had one tag to fill, but I think their spirits were broke. Yeah, absolutely. They were defeated. I don't think they were having a good time anymore. But uh, I think it has something to do from where they're from and what they're used to hunting. They, yeah. they tell you in orientation right before you fly out, like, hey, this is a DIY hunt. You paid to do this. Don't call me crying, wanting to leave. And I think they get a lot of that. I mean, I know they get a lot of that. I think that's why they don't communicate very often with you because they don't want to hear you crying about <laughs> what you paid to go do. <laughs> and I've I've heard stories where, you know, the you'll be out in the field and they won't come pick you up. And so you in reach your wife, their number, and then the wife starts calling them. And, you know, yelling at them about, go, go pick up my husband. We're ready to come home. And I think they just get tired of that. So their communications lack thereof, but I understand that. And we knew that going into it. So it wasn't a, wasn't a problem. Yeah. 
you guys lost, you know, four, four or five days or whatever. You're in the field now. You obviously, as you said, can't hunt the day you fly in. How many days of hunting do you have left? We wanted all five of our hunt days. I mean, we we had all taken two weeks off of work. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, we, and that was kind of the reason our, you know, first two buddies didn't go. They just didn't have the time off. To... Okay. So you guys losing four days didn't necessarily cut the hunt short. It just extended the amount of time that you're up there total. Yes. Correct. Yeah. You know, day one of the hunt, um, you know, we're all fired up and it's socked in fog. Come out of the tent. I mean, what, nine o'clock, we finally left the tent and decided, hey, we'll just hike up to this ridge and set up our tarp and, you know, hope for a break in the in the fog. And I mean, it stayed foggy pretty well all morning. Um, We were up under the tent just waiting for it to lift. It finally lifted, and we see three caribou just, I mean, what, 150 yards below us? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, first caribou that we can hunt right there. Um, so we jump out of the tent, uh, out of the tarp, and kind of mad dash to try to make a play on these things. And ended up not harvesting a bull. Bart was first up to shoot. Um, How did that we, happen? We rolled dice. Yeah, we rolled dice to see who would shoot first because we knew the first day we were all just going to hang out together. And so we're like, we got to figure out a shooting order. So it was my father-in-law, then Cody, then I, then Curtis. So Bart was first up. We're like, hey, let's go. You know, we were all excited. First caribou. We thought this was going to be a, you know, a tough hunt. And so far it is. We're socked in all day long. So we're trying to take the best with our opportunity we have in front of us. And it was a, mad dash i mean you can you can imagine what we're talking about when we say we grabbed guns and took off running to try to circle around them to get in on a shot bart throws his gun up and there's rain in his lenses and everything's fogged and he ends up missing and when it was all said and done he was he was upset with himself but also i think a little happy that he did miss because he didn't want it to end that fast and be over and and not we never really got a good look at these bulls prior to us running over there so it worked out great that he did miss and then so that happens we get back and the fog sets back in you can't see anything we get back under our tarps that's that's one piece of gear i would say that everybody it's a must you have some kind of tarp set up that you can get out of the wind because I don't know about August, but September, you're going to have constant 30 to 40 mile an hour winds nonstop all day long. So to be able to set up some kind of shelter and hide behind is key. Did you guys do just like a flat tarp and kind of a frame or lean to it or something more structured? What tarp did you have? Well, yeah, I did. I, it was, so it was a seek outside. I think it's called a DX t or dxp tarp i think it's a eight by 12 kind um, of a diamond shape yeah, yeah we would set it up as a diamond fly because you get the most coverage with that and still be able to see pretty good out of it it's a little tight with four guys but we made it work it's better for two guys to get under right. but um so we we're everybody's kind of down we were talking about the do you know the lessons learned from that little experience we didn't take a pack we didn't take a second gun we didn't have good support for his shooting setup it was just we're like okay well if this happens again let's grab our stuff and actually do this right well yeah let's be smart about this <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so we a couple hours later we see a grizz come by and we get some pictures of him think it's all cool and We're sitting there. We finally, about three o'clock, we've had enough. We're like, let's just go walk. I can't sit under this tarp anymore. Cody, I'll let you take it from here. Yeah, so we we had noticed there was a, I guess you'd call it a stream, what, 800 yards from where we had been glassing. So we decided just kind of take off towards the stream. I think everybody was needing to refill their analogy and wanted to cross the stream and go check out some caribou we had glassed up earlier and we're walking across the tussocks there and I just happened to look over and there's a caribou, what, 
300 yards just coming over a ridge. We all throw glass up, small bull. I mean, we immediately knew, like, this is not a shooter. Um, so we're just kind of sitting there watching him, and he kept looking back behind him. And we just see tops coming over this ridge, and we're everybody knew immediately, like, hey, this is probably a shooter. And then his bosses started coming over, great bosses, and then we see a gigantic shovel. And so I tell everybody, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to try to take this bull, get down on the pack, get the gun out. I think he was 310 yards, Jared. Yeah. Yeah, Jared's throwing out ranges. Um, so get down on the pack shoot hit um uh, shoot miss and then hit him again he went down you know high five started and then he got back up um hit him again walked up to him and i mean gosh that first time any of us putting hands on a caribou was a pretty awesome moment yeah it was it was a great moment because this is that's what i told the other three i was like hey this is the caribou we came to alaska for we all had in our minds shooting giants, but we all said too that we just want a good representation of a caribou. We're not looking for trophies here. We just want something we can show our families and be proud of. And Cody had just done that. He killed a beautiful bull. So there was lots of hugs, high fives, and then the work started. What's it expectations versus reality match just in terms of the animal caribou once you get up close, put your hands on that type of thing, like body size, anything that stood out, you know, I, I remember personally, like their hides were so freaking cool, like just soft and gorgeous. And I didn't, I didn't estimate that. Yeah. Softest, thickest hide I've ever, ever felt. I mean, they, they're just, a, I mean, they're a beautiful animal. They really are. And, it didn't, you know, mule deer and elk, they kind of have a smell to them. I didn't notice that with the caribou. I mean, I, I, they just awesome animal. Yeah. And as far as body size, I, I remember hearing y'all talk about y'all's caribou hunt this year, saying how big the body sizes were. And I know you've been to Kotzebue also. And so I would compare it to uh, in between a mule deer and a, a cow elk. Spike elk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably a spike elk, something like that. I mean, they're not giant. Uh, they look a lot bigger until you get their hide off. Their hide is super thick, fluffy. But once you get the hide off, you're like, oh, well, it's a deer. This isn't going to be that bad. And the yeah. unit we're hunting, you're allowed to debone in the field. So Cody, Curtis, and Bart started working on his animal. And as soon as they got the first quarter off, I had a tarp set up and started deboning everything and putting it in bags. So it worked out really good. We we finished up with that first caribou, I don't know, an hour, hour and 15, something like that, and had our packs on, and we're headed back to camp. Nice. How far was this from camp? A little over a mile. Not bad. Yeah. No, it wasn't bad at all. So we get back to camp, celebrate. We it's The weather's kind of breaking up a little bit. It's not that windy. The sun's trying to peek through that evening. So we're like, man, let's cook up this heart, use some of these onions and potatoes we have. So we ended up doing that. It's delicious. Probably the best heart I've ever eaten. Uh, I was really surprised with that. And after getting home and eating some of the other meat, I'm very surprised how tender this meat is. I don't know if your caribou from the mountains was the same way, but yeah. I can't compare it to anything else. I mean, it's super tender. Yeah. When we were eating it in the field, we were all like just amazed with it. But it was also like, ah, maybe our perspective skewed, right? Like you're in the field, well, and you're hungry, <laughs> yada, yada, yada. That's but, what I've said too. <laughs> yeah. When we but, like the meals I've had since being home, I just, yeah, it's phenomenal. Good. Yeah. Very good. So we do that that evening. We're, you know, like I said, we're celebrating a little bit. Got the first caribou down. We still have four or five days left. Um, we all go to bed kind of early so we can wake up and get going in the morning. Wake up the next morning. It's kind of Can I interrupt the same. you before we get yeah. into this next day? Yeah. So you talked about the guys that were, you know, near the camp. You When you guys flew in, there was those other guys at the other camp, the father and sons. 
sounds like they had maybe some issues with bears, meat, et cetera. Now you guys have a caribou down, the first caribou down, and have multiple days in the field. So what was the plan strategy for taking care of the meat, but also, you know, hopefully keeping bears away over the next five plus days? So Curtis brought a grizz fence. Um, and what we did is we set up the grizz fence probably, what, 20 yards from our tent? It was close. Yeah, it was close. Um, there was a little pile of some brush. I mean, it was, we tried to get it out of the swamp and kind of get it up on some brush, but then we had two extra tent poles that we kind of arched over and just jammed into the ground and put like a eight by 10 tarp over it, essentially making a small tent looking, you know, just to keep any rain off of, to try to keep it dry. And really we had good luck um, kind of jumping ahead, but we didn't have any bear problems until the very last night. And he ripped down our fence and kind of drug the fence and a game bag up the hill. Um, didn't end up getting any meat, but he did, he did get into it the last night. So speaking of the bear fence, Curtis's wife's probably going to listen to this podcast. And that was one of the deals where she said, you're not going unless you take this. Well, I guess she didn't specify what we had to use it for <laughs> because I told the guys like, Hey, bear's not going to come in our tent. We don't have to worry about that. Let's use this bear fence for our meat. I mean, we're spending a bunch of money on this. I want to bring meat home. Yeah. So we all agreed on that. And we learned, they tell you put your meat like 50, 60 yards away from you. If I had to do it all over again, I'd put it right in between our two tents, put your tents 10, 15 yards away and then put your meat in between and put a bear fence in between. The bears do not like structures. Mm -hmm. if, if they see that, they, they tend to not mess with it. The, the other guys had just had theirs on a blue tarp out in the middle of the tundra and the bears just free for all on it. Oh, I bet. Yeah. 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 So we, like Cody said, we don't have any problems the first day. Nothing comes into camp. And I think even that night, the bear came back and raided the other guy's stuff again. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with like, you're on one hand, you're remote, right? Like you flew 120 miles, got dropped here, but hunters are getting dropped in these, if not exact same locations, the same vicinities, like off of yes. these lakes, like year after year, week after week during the season. And these bears are not stupid. They have no. guys like the guys before you who just like set out a free meal on a tarp. They're going to raid that all day. But as you said, you put some structure, create some shelter. Like I know on our caribou hunt up in Cots, we just we did something similar as you guys with like a little bit of brush we could use and just having a tarp. And especially with the breeze, that tarp like moves and shakes and makes some noise. I don't think they want much of anything to do with that. No. That's what exactly we right. I was going to touch base on that too. I mean, these camps are pretty much the same ones year in and year out. They they build a landing strip on top of these mountains or a sandbar or whatever. The bears aren't stupid. They know what time of the year it is when they start seeing those camps get set up. It's an easy meal. And from what we've seen, when you harvest a caribou, they will be on that carcass that night, if not a couple hours after you had killed it. And then that night they'll be in camp looking for the rest of it. Mm -hmm. They, It's just a, an easy meal for them. And know that going into this hunt, you will you will have bears around you the whole time. But I never felt scared or felt like we were going to get attacked or anything. It was never an issue for us. We did have one come into camp while Bart was taping out his caribou. And it, it got to about 60 yards before Curtis had seen him. But they, they stood up, threw their hands up, started yelling, and the bear turned around and ran. So wasn't an issue well i derailed us but i wanted to like understand a timeline with what, what you guys were doing with meat so we'll top back into the, the next day and keep hunting it sounds like yeah so day two we wake up winds blowing it's no i'm sorry day it's two cold. we wake up it's cold and clear 20, yeah 24 degrees bluebird skies just a beautiful frost on everything and we're like man this is a great morning we go to our little glass knob and there's caribou everywhere it's they 
I guess when you have a good weather day, they get up and move because every ridge top you could see, every valley you could see for miles just had caribou in them. Really? And Bart and Curtis had got a jump on us that morning from camp and they got to the glass knob first. And so by the time me and Cody had got there, um, Bart and Curtis were already down on their guns and we're like, okay, well, here we go. You know, so we, <laughs> we sat down and put glass on them and I started video and thinking I might be able to get a shot on camera and, um, uh, we don't see anything happening. They're just watching them go by and they're like 200 yards away. It looks like, um, so they all leave and there's a group of, I think five or six bulls that were pretty decent and actually really good. And they came by me and I was like, man, it's only day two. I don't, I'm not done yet. I don't want to shoot yet unless it's, you know, something I can't live without. So we watch them go by us and we go meet up with Bart and Curtis and find out, no, they were shooting. They just weren't connecting. And uh, those bulls end up going over the ridge where we were camped at and the guys from Florida were still there. So they start firing. And at this point, they're firing back at us. So me and Cody had already had a game plan. We were going to cover some ground today. So we just take off. We're like, I'm not getting shot by another hunter. So me and Cody take off and we make it across the river and we start going up the other ridge and we hear a weird sound kind of back towards camp. It's, it's kind of like a gunshot, but not really. And we just blow it off we keep hiking once we get on top we can look back down in the valley and we see curtis and bart over there taking care of a bull so I, everybody's shooting suppressed and suppressed about six eight hundred yards away sounds very unique it doesn't sound like a gunshot you know especially with the wind and everything mm -hmm. so at this point we're too far to turn around and go back and help them they're capable guys. They can handle this. They're less than a mile from camp. So it won't be that bad of a pack out for them anyways. So me and Cody, we take off and we get to the next ridge and wind is howling. I mean, 50, 60 miles an hour once you get on the ridge and there's caribou bedded at the tops, but nothing we wanted. So we just keep side hilling around and peeking over the next mountain and we get to a point midday or something. We, we see a Wolverine and we start seeing some bears and seeing caribou, just nothing, nothing I wanted. So we just keep making tracks. I think we finally get back to camp. We did about eight miles that day. And if anybody's been up there, you know, eight miles is pretty tough through tussocks. I think they say you can times that by three walking through that stuff. And, it is pretty rough, but it's doable. Just take it slow and use trekking poles. Yeah, it's a big day up there for sure. Yeah, yeah, a lot of elevation gain too. Where we were at, we weren't in the just flat tundra. We were in the foothills of the brooks. So there was lots of rolling hills, some pretty good mountains around us that you could go up on. You would gain anywhere from eight to 1,200 foot of ele elevation. So it was, it was a good day. We seen a lot of caribou, seen a lot of bears, got kind of a game plan for the next day. Well, I say that we get back to camp and now Cody and Curtis have killed bulls less or right at a mile from camp. And I told him, I was like, man, we just did eight miles. I don't know if you need to. I, so let's just the next day, let's go sit up on our glass knob and just see what happens. If everybody else is killing a mile, I don't know why we can't either. We went to bed early. I mean, we were just done with wind. I mean, we were in, we were in tents and like in sleeping bags by seven thirty, and uh, wind wind was howling. Um, but I wake up, look at my phone. It's nine o'clock. Man, needed to take a leak. Trying to decide whether or not I want to get out of the tent now or later. Decide to get out. Immediately after sticking my head out of the tent, there's a tank of a bull and a cow, I mean, right behind our tent, like 40 yards walking the ridge. I knew Jared was kind of being picky. I mean, he 
he had something in mind that he was looking for. I don't have binoculars. I don't have anything. I just, I can see his frame. I know he's a shooter. I, I made the decision to go wake up Bart because I thought he was more of just looking for a good bull. Um, so I like walk over to his tent, unzip it. Hey, grab your gun. There's a shooter. He looked at me so confused. I mean, he didn't know if it was <laughs> nine o'clock at night, two in the morning, six o'clock the next morning. I mean, he just had the craziest look on his face. And I'm like, grab your gun. We got to go. So, I mean, he grabs his gun, throws on, I ha- I'm in Crocs. I, I, I think he had like some muck boots for camp boots or something, but he throws on his boots, me and him take off running. I mean, he's, caribou saw me and went over the ridge and by the time we get to the top he's in the bottom it's like 250 yards bart doesn't have his contacts in uh so he gets down on his gun and i'm telling him like hey it's the one in the middle he just turned around like i'm trying to describe what the caribou's doing so he can pick out the right one and he's finally on it and he's like okay yep i can tell it's a bull i said yeah only bull in the group shoot it shoots it i mean it runs 40 yards dumps we look back and curtis is like pulling on his pants coming over the ridge we give him the you know hands up in the air it's done deal i go back to camp jared's still asleep like he had no clue oh my god all all this is going on i unzip the tent tell him hey grab your stuff bart just dumped a bull he has the exact same look on his face that bart (laughs) did like he, he was so confused like I mean, dead sleep, woken up, hey, Bart dumped a bull. So we (laughs) grab grab our packs, put on, you know, the the right shoes and everything, get to him, um, end up getting that bull back to camp right at midnight. I mean, it's basically good and dark right as we're getting back to camp. Um, And I mean, the whole time, Bart's just like, he couldn't even process it. He's like, man, what happened? Like, what just happened? I I was asleep seven minutes ago, and now there's a dead bull. Like how how? Yeah, so it, yeah. It, Bart I mean, was in he, shock, <laughs> and it it was a good bull. I mean, he had some good webbing, like decent palmation up top, double shovel, um, big framed bull. I mean, it was a fantastic bull. And as we're walking up to it, I'm thinking like, crap! I never really looked at this thing through glass. Like, I hope he's happy with it. I just he kind of went on. Hey, there it is. Shoot it. You know, my judgment on whether or not he was shooting, but turned out to be a great bull. Wow. Even when we walked up to it, he was still in shock over the whole deal. And we start taking care of it. He's like, oh, I'll just Euro it. I'm like, ah, oh, Bart, I, I think we need to take this one out. I think you're going to think it's a lot better tomorrow when you see it, you know? Mm-hmm. And sure enough, the next day, luckily we caped it all out got it packed back and the next day he's looking at it he's like wow that's now that i have my contacts in this is a really <laughs> good bull <laughs> uh, so that worked out like cody said we we were up you know pretty late then and so we kind of slip in the next day and we go up everybody's done except me now and we like I said, we had talked about maybe staying a little bit closer to camp because now at this point, three people have killed bulls less than a mile from camp. Yeah. And I was like, how let's many, go to our glass and knob. And, oh, go ahead. Yeah. How many caribou are you guys seeing like per day, roughly? Well, the first day, not a lot, uh, a handful, really. Because yeah, that was fog. like the fog and everything. Yeah. Right? The fog. Like that clear this... day you guys said, even from camp before you started covering country, you're kind of seeing caribou everywhere. That clear day, I bet we seen probably 600. Are you kidding me? No, no. Just like waves of them. I mean, you just, because you can see. It was like full on migration. They're cruising, moving just everywhere. Yes. That's like the exact opposite experience of when I was at Katsubu. Like we saw. Right. A couple dozen caribou the entire week, maybe, you know. No, that first group that we seen that morning probably had 50 in it. Yeah, and you're just seeing multiple, multiple groups like that. Yes, yeah, anywhere yeah. from anywhere from twelve to fifty in a group. Uh, but we were up on a a high glassing point, so we could see that morning. We could see over ten miles. 
So mm-hmm. I say 600, but we're, we're covering a lot of ground through glass. But yeah, I mean, that's, you're still hitting it right migration wise. Cause we had very yes. similar, like, oh, we can see a caribou five miles away, but it's, there's like one caribou, you know? So it's just, it's right. so funny, like how different the experience can be. Cause we were up there roughly like the same time as well. I mean, this was years ago, but still it's just yeah. like, you don't know what you're going to get, man. No, you don't. And that terrain is so deceiving. You you look out across six miles and you see three caribou and you're like, man, this is going to be a, a rough day. But there's so many rolling hills and valleys and ravines, and cuts and everything else that they hide in when the wind's bad. That if you just get out and walk a little bit, stay high and glass, you will start seeing them. It's, it was crazy. So that's what our plan was the third day is just glass. The wind was tough. It was blowing 40, 50 miles an hour. And we, so can I extrapolate on exactly what you just said? You said sit in glass, but you're also dealing with crazy winds. It's cold when you're in the wind, even if it's not super cold. So like practically, how are you guys staying comfortable to sustain sitting and glassing for longer periods of time? What helped you do that? Puffies and rain gears. <laughs> yep. Puffies and un- under the tarp. Um, because we really on day three, me and Jared spent eight hours underneath the tarp. And and without the tarp and the puffies, we would have been confined to the tent. Yeah. That and then I will say we we had these little lightweight chairs. There's not much to them. It's just a seat in the back, not a lot of cushion. But I think they're called Crazy Creek Chairs or 50 yep. bucks, but it was worth every penny. I don't take them backpack hunting, but for a hunt like this, like a drop camp and you're going a mile or a few miles or something like that and mostly sitting and glassing, those things are so beneficial. Yes. Yeah, I think very, they're Crazy yeah. Creek. Yeah, Crazy Creek. Yeah, I would re- definitely recommend that to anybody that's going. But we, so we sit there, like Cody said, eight to 10 hours that day. And we're watching, we could kind of see where Curtis's carcass was. And we have bears on it all day that we're getting to watch. So it's, we're getting to see stuff all day, but the there's no caribou anywhere close to us. We're watching them a couple miles away. Um, but we kind of start seeing a, a pattern with them. The there's big groups of cows and behind the cows we're noticing there's always four or five bulls that kind of lag behind the herd. The herd will move off to a different ridge and then out of nowhere, here's four or five bulls on their tail, but they're not really rutting right now. Uh, they're just staying close to the herds. So we, we kind of keep tabs on a couple different bulls that we want to get a little bit closer and take a look at, but we figured we'll, see on the next day because like i said in the past three days we kind of watched these caribou are bedding up high and then feeding down low during the day and then going back up at the end of the day so we're watching all these bulls go back up to bed we're like well tomorrow we'll get closer and see if one of these is a shooter so we end day three getting back to camp curtis and bart had glassed up some on an opposite mountain range from us and i barely got a look through the spotter at them uh right before dark and i've seen maybe a couple of these have some potential it might be worth going to check these out in the morning before we head all the way north to go see these other ones so we get a good night's sleep that night wake up load our packs and we take out and the goal was to go to this closer mountain and just get eyes on this group and see if it's worth worth our time so we i think it's about two miles over there we hike up get on top of the ridge and we see the group of caribou they're down the ridge about a mile so cody and i we decided we've got the wind in our face we drop down we could side hill around close distance pop back up and get a better look at them well as we're dropping down the valley to our right there's all of a sudden caribou in there that we didn't see the whole time we were hiking up this mountain. So we, we crouched down and Mark, you know how these mountains look up there. There's nothing but rock and just 
like smushy grass, <laughs> lichen, I guess is what it is. It's like a sponge with yeah. rocks and no cover at all, just completely bald. And we're 600 yards from these caribou. So we, we sit down, pull the glass out. We see a big herd of cows. And we're like, okay, well, from the previous experience, we know there's probably going to be some bulls around here somewhere. So we start looking and about 2,000 yards away. We see a group of five or six shooter bulls. We're like, okay, well, this is working out. These bulls are most likely going to come over here to these cows at some point today. We just got to wait them out. And as they get closer, we get glass on them. We we realize like, hey, this this is the one. This is the one I want. He had crazy tops, big long daggers coming off the top. I was like, this is a good representation of a, a caribou that I would like to take. So now we got to try to figure out how to get to them. Uh, there's no cover at all. Um, that we decide we're just going to start scooting down on our butts. We have our packs in our lap, and we're just scooting down the mountain. You know five, six foot at a time, then stop. Just make sure nothing spotted us, and then we move a little bit closer. We do this for 300 yards down the mountain, 200 yards down the mountain. And it took us, I don't know, two and a half hours to get down there, just inching along, trying not to get busted. Well, and, and the whole time, these bulls look like they're going to feed right under us. We're thinking like, hey, if we can get to this little point, they're going to feed right under us 300 yards, no problem. In the meantime, the cows feared away from us to the opposite ridge. And those bulls took like a 45 heading directly away from us. Yeah. And that's, it sunk in at this point where, man, this was the bull I wanted. And now he's gone forever <laughs> because mm. there's no way to get to the next mountain range without being spotted so in the meantime we're just hunkered down and over this saddle comes more herds of caribou and this is like day two where it's a sunny day the wind's kind of bad but it's a beautiful day and the caribou are out moving and they're just coming across this saddle in herds of 20 to 40 to 100 and we're like, man, there's some good bulls in here, too. I, I'm not going to be as happy with it, I don't think, but we can get it done. So we we get set up. All of a sudden, this group of bulls breaks free from their cows that he was on and start coming across the tussocks towards us again. And I'm like, holy cow, this might work out. Now they're at 800. They're closing distance. Now they're at 600. Now they're at 500. I was like, this is going to work, you know? And then they bet. And I was, it, we just had to sit there again for, I don't know, a, another hour, I guess. At this point, we're, we had been s scooting down the mountain for three hours and sitting there. And I was starting to get cold because all I had on was my rain pants and my rain jacket and a little hoodie. I had my puffy gear in my pack, but I was afraid. We were so close to all these other caribou, getting a jacket out, pulling my bino harness off and having to put the jacket on and putting the raincoat back on. I Just too much movement and we'd get spotted and get busted. So we just sat there and shivered basically for another well, hour while these bulls were bedded. Well, and I think it's a good point too that, I mean, we had caribou 280 degrees around us. I mean, we were literally surrounded by caribou. Yeah. So like Jared said, we were kind of, you know, we didn't have another option but to sit there. And then like the ones that you're concerned with, like movement of, hey, I don't even know if I can get my jacket out and on. Like how close? 60 yards. I mean, the ones that were on top of the hill that we originally tried to make a play on fed off and down into this valley. And I mean, they knew we were there. I don't think they knew what we were, but yeah. Um, they were curious and very close. Okay. Yeah, 60 to 80 yards from us. So I start getting antsy. I'm excited. I've practiced all year, previous years, shooting long range. I feel very confident at 500 yards. So I'm dialing for wind and dope and everything. And 
I tell Cody, like, get the camera on him. As soon as he stands, I'm going to drop him. Well, we set, set, set. He never stands. And Cody's like, I think we should get a little closer. And I was afraid we were going to get busted. But after 20 more minutes, I was like, you're right. Let's get a little closer. So we drop down. And we get to the point where I, I don't feel like we can get any closer before we get busted. And we're at. I guess originally we were at 540. We were at 490 now. I told Cody, like, hey, I'm comfortable right here. I don't want to move anymore. Let's go ahead and just get a, a solid foundation for the rifle, and I'll be good. So I was able to lay prone, gun over the pack. I have actually have that tarp in a little stuff sack as my rear support, which worked out great. Um, he, The bull never stands. And I couldn't take it anymore. And I told Cody I was going to put one in him. And then when he stands, I'll put another one in him and finish him. So I shoot, end up not adjusting for the right wind. The wind where we were at was completely different from the wind where he was at. It was way, it was cutting up this saddle a lot more than what I expected. So I ended up missing to the right, readjusted put one in him, he stands up. I have to wait at this point because now he is in the herd. So I, I have no shot, um, but I know I have one in him. So we know we can make it work. Um, the herd finally moves out of the way, put a third one in him and he drops. So I was on the phone or in reach with Curtis and Bart telling them like, hey, we've got one at 500 yards. When he stands, I'm putting, putting him down. And at that point, when they received that message, they started walking towards us, but didn't know where we were. Um, me and Cody, we went over there, took pictures, high fives, did the whole nine yards. And I get a message from Curtis saying they're on the mountain, but don't see us. So I send him GPS coordinates and he doesn't know how to put them in go hunt to figure out where we're at. So that's another thing. If you're hunting with a group, do this prior to going out hunting, show everybody how to input GPS coordinates in your map to be able to figure out where people are. But luckily we were able to put Cody's pack cover. He had an orange pack cover on a trekking pole on top of a little hill and they were able to see it and come right to us. About the time we had finished up deboning and had everything in bags. So that worked out perfect. We didn't have to make multiple trips getting my bull out. We were able to get everything in one trip. I think Jared's was just under three miles from camp. So still not horribly far. Yeah, not too bad. With the shot again, it, I mean, on one hand, you were patient. And then on the other hand, you're like, I can't take it more. I have to do something. Uh, after that being three hours, was that the good decision? I think so. I, I don't think we made the wrong decision. Um, yeah. I believe I would have missed if he stood up too, just because of the wind was so bad. It was my fault on misjudging the wind, but I was able to correct it on the second and third shot. So it wasn't that big of an issue and shooting suppressed. They have no idea what's going on, especially when you have a 40 mile an hour wind, you shoot and no, nothing moves. They have no clue what's going on until you actually hit something. And then they're like, oh, okay, something's not right here. But if I had to do it all over again, I probably would, would have shot sooner actually, instead of sitting there for so and freezing to death. When that bull originally bedded, he was at a strange position. He was kind of leaning on the side we could see. So there really wasn't a shot for a long time. And finally, he kind of shifted more, you know, straight up where there was a picture of vitals. And that's kind of when Jared's like, all right, we're 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 a little closer now. And I actually can, you know, sneak one in there. So, yeah, we, we get that one back to camp. And that's when the celebration really happens we've got four bulls down in four days and we had packed in some spirits so we finished all those that night and had a good meal and we had text the transporter as we were packing my bull out i i'd let him know hey we are tagged out if you need to come get me uh, you can or we'll be available for pickup tomorrow if you know weather permitted and he just 
text back like, yeah, we'll touch base with you in the morning. So we have a good night that night, wake up the next morning to a message saying, you know, we can get you today. What's the weather conditions? And so go outside of the tent. It's, it's actually a beautiful day for flying. It looks like for us, you know, and message them back what the weather conditions are. And on that, if you do go to this hunt, they're going to request visibility, uh, wind direction, ceiling, ceiling, ceiling of the fog. Yeah. And not know, like, I mean, random person, you're not going to know what the ceiling height of what fog is. So we're just kind of guessing that stuff. But then I've realized you can use Onyx and look at the surrounding mountains and figure out what the elevation of those are and send that to them. So say the fog's at 3000 foot right now, uh, the wind's coming from the South patchy skies in, and you can use Onyx again to look at landmarks and figure out how far away they are and say visibility is eight miles or in our case, it was over 10 miles, 360 degrees. And that's good information for them. They they seem to like that better than, oh, it's sun shining. Yeah, those are good tips. Yeah, really good tips. So when I originally seen this message come in i was still sleeping when i was reading it to cody and i read it as okay we're we're coming today be ready camp broke horns cut everything on the runway by 12. so it's a mad dash at this point because i think it was 8 30 when i seen this text come in so we're breaking camp getting everything hauled up the hill to the strip um we, we get all that done by 12 and we set up the chairs and tables, start playing cards and keep checking phone, no updates. He's, he keeps asking for weather updates. So we keep giving him weather updates. And it kind of goes silent. And I look back through my text and I see the original message said, break camp, get everything up there. We won't be there before 12. <laughs> so that was my fault on that deal, but it worked out. <laughs> We uh we set up our tarps so we had some rain come through and whatnot, and then everybody's spirits started going south. Cause it's three o'clock at this point. We've been up there for a while. We haven't heard any communication from the transporter. The weather's kind of turning bad at this point. And in the back of all of our minds, we're thinking it's not gonna happen today. We're gonna have to tote all this stuff back down there and reset up camp and four o'clock rolls around five o'clock rolls around still haven't heard anything at this point i message them and just say hey can we get an update um no response so i was going to give it till about seven and then go set camp back up but finally about 6 20 we start hearing a plane come through and it then everybody's spirits are it was like day four again when everybody was upset and then you get to go and you see that plane and everybody's happy again you know you're yeah. going home <laughs> yeah but um we get everything loaded up get back to town get everything in the meat boxes sealed up get our horns wrapped so you're up. doing that where you're packing up the meat and wrapping horns and all that where we're doing that at the landing strip at their little connex area they've got okay. there. They they have saran wrap, duct tape, uh, cardboard. They have everything there for purchase, so you don't have to bring it. So they have okay. meat boxes, which is basically a wax sealed cardboard box with a plastic liner. Yep. And since we had already deboned all our meat, it was very easy for us. All we had to do is dump our game bags in a plastic liner and then tape it up, and we were yep. done. We spent a little bit of time on the horns. Uh, Bart and Curtis were flying back to Montana. Cody and I were flying back to New Mexico. So we packaged our horns up together as one check bag, basically. And they took us back to the hotel. The hotel there in Cotsabu has a freezer. You can store meat in overnight. Uh, we had purchased our plane tickets for the ride home. That was one other thing. We bought one-way tickets up there not knowing when we were going to come back. I told everybody, don't waste your time on buying return flights because 
depending on weather. We don't know where we're coming from. And Alaska, I think, only gives you one chance to change your flight on the return. And then you have to start paying again. So we knew we could always, there's two flights out of Kotzebue a day. They're never full. It wasn't going to be a problem to get a return, at least from Kotzebue to Anchorage. And then from Anchorage to Seattle, there's planes in and out all day. The only problem would be from Seattle to Albuquerque because they only run one of those a day. But wasn't an issue. We booked our return flights. Uh, I would recommend upgrading to first class on your way back uh, just for the check bags, honestly. It was almost a wash. Um, yeah. We were able to to fly first class and get that extra check bag free. And I think it was all in all, maybe an extra 50 bucks to have a lot more room. Yeah. I think you get two check bags free when you upgrade. And then we had to, we each had to pay for two more with meat and stuff. We ended up splitting, splitting boxes around. And so each one of us had four, four bags we were checking coming home. We had a, I think a 12 hour layover in Seattle. And on the way up, we had the same thing. Um, we had like 10 hours in Seattle and then another 10 hours in Anchorage. And we just hung out in the airport. And I would not recommend that. If you <laughs> have time, get a hotel, get a good night's sleep and finish your travel the next day. On the way up, you had 10 hours in Seattle and 10 hours in Anchorage? Yes. Oh, that's brutal. Yeah, yeah it was brutal. Thing. Seattle like wasn't between, too bad. Between that travel schedule and then spending the four plus whatever days in Kotzebue, I could get why you guys were freaking cranky. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. It was rough. And like I said, Cody and I on the way up, we didn't get any sleep. You're too excited at the front end of a hunt to get any sleep, and especially in a in an airport. You know, we tried in Anchorage because we landed in Anchorage around, I don't know, 12, 1, one in the morning or something. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we lay down on the chairs like everybody else does in there, but people don't care. They're trying to sleep. They'll be sitting next to you, yapping on the phone, or they were doing cleaning in the airport at that time. So there's vacuum cleaners all around us all night long, couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend just if you have a long layover, just Uber and get a hotel, get a good good sleep, and then come back. Well, success. Success with uh didn't come easy. You guys had a lot of setbacks as usual with Alaska in terms of weather and travel and everything else. But as you said before, like once you get to do the hunt and then especially have a successful hunt, like all that stuff goes out the window. You forget about that. It does. And I, I try to explain to the group before we go, you have to look at this as an adventure more so than a hunt. No matter how the outcome is, like this is going to be a fun adventure. Sure. The ups and downs, you, you'll you remember those more so than the actual hunt itself. That's a good mindset, even on the travel of, I mean, it's not a fun part, but make that part of the experience. Because if you're only going from like, I leave my house and I want to get in the field and you're skipping everything in the middle, everything does feel like setbacks, frustration and delays. But especially if you're with a good group of guys and it's like, roll with the punches, make the best of it go get the burger, do whatever. Like it is part of the experience and just being open-minded and not solely focused on the only experience being in the field. Uh, it just changes your expectations and perspective and allows you to handle it all better. Absolutely. You have to know that going into a hunt like this, especially if you're going with a transporter and you're doing any kind of air travel, you're on their terms. So there's a lot of sitting around waiting. Just be okay with that. And same thing in the field. I mean, you're going to have bad weather days. Be comfortable being uncomfortable. You're going to just be sitting there getting pounded by rain or wind or whatever. Just live up the experience. Because me and Cody got to come home to 105 degrees weather still. Awesome. We can wrap it there unless you guys have something else we want to make sure we hit or cover. It was really good. You know, I think this was a great first time, you know, way to break into an Alaska hunt. Um, I would add that if you're looking into this hunt, 
I've gone back and forth on whether or not it was challenging. I think it was maybe more mentally challenging than physically. Mm -hmm. Um, but just, just make sure that you're, you know, in, in a place where you can mentally handle it and, you know, make sure that you're matching your skill level with what this hunt requires. Um, I think the Florida group did not have a good time and I think they probably will not go back to Alaska again. I think we all had a fantastic time. Uh, you know, we spent six months just cramming as much information as we could. Uh, we watched countless hours of YouTube, listened to podcast after pod. I mean, anything that we could tie to this hunt, we, we researched. So I would say do your research and make sure it's the right hunt for you. But I got the entire experience I wanted. I mean, it, it, a hundred percent checked all the boxes that that i was looking to check yeah and if this is something that's on your list to do don't wait just do it it's only going to get more expensive every year it goes up get it just bite the bullet and do it start saving money now and start talking to transporters figure out who you want to use and just do it you will not regret it well those are great words to end on Guys, if you have any questions, comments, feedback, or listener story suggestion for us, send an email to podcast at exomountaingear.com. And if you haven't yet, be sure to hit subscribe or follow in your podcast app so that you receive future episodes automatically and as always for free. Thank you for doing that and appreciate you tuning in and supporting the show. We'll talk to you soon.